We continue today looking at uh, how to be really great. That was our theme, part one was last week, and uh, we're going to have a look at the same theme today. It's true humility, really, that is the theme. Um, it was said of John the Baptist that he will be great in the sight of the Lord. So there is a true greatness, is to be great in the kingdom, to be great in the sight of the Lord. And um, John Stott, I quoted um, him last week, John Stott, the, the Anglican uh, preacher, theologian, he said that uh, our greatest enemy is pride and our greatest ally is humility. And then I suggested that um, if this is true, then we must consider daily how we can weaken the grip of our enemy, that is pride, and strengthen our greatest friend, which is humility. So as we approach Easter, uh, and as we get near to the cross, um, it's good to be able to focus on the one who left heaven uh, and who humbled himself even to death upon the cross. In fact, I want to read those words again from Philippians, because we're looking at our attitude. And in Philippians chapter 2, um, here's the Apostle Paul. He says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So today we'll continue to seek to weaken the grip of our greatest enemy and to strengthen our friend, true humility, that we might uh, be pleasing to God and be great in his kingdom. Um, now, three points really, uh, as usual. Um, our reactions then our actions, and then finally, of course, we'll look at the cross, and uh, surely that is our greatest help in, in the battle. So our reactions um, might seem a strange place to start, our reactions. Well, of course, our reactions are more accurate than our actions. Um, our reactions are spontaneous. We don't have time to put our best front on. Um, we're off guard, no time to, to prepare. So our reactions say quite a lot about us. And notice Paul says, he says, your attitude. It's all about our attitude. It's an ongoing attitude that we're to have rather than putting on a few uh, good displays um, every now and then. Um, and I guess a question, a good question to ask at the start is, well, how then should we react to those who dislike us, don't appreciate us, or actively oppose us? How are we to react? How are we to respond? And well, 1 Peter is helpful here because he points us to Christ's attitude. 1 Peter and, and chapter 2, maybe we'll go from verse 19. Uh, no, we can start a little bit later than that. Um, he's speaking about suffering and enduring. Verse 21, to this, that is to suffering for the gospel, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example, there's that word again, an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. So that's Christ's attitude. And now we looked last week at his example, and, and he, he said quite clearly to those disciples after he'd washed their feet, um, I've set an example for you. And here's Peter using the same word. Christ is our example. Of course, he's our saviour. Um, years ago, there was that teaching that we just have to be uh, like Jesus, and it left out the cross, it left out conversion, it left out being born again. 
just try and make your Christ your pattern. Well, of course, that's the cart before the horse. We'll be driven to despair if we had to get to heaven by using Christ as our pattern and example and try to live like him. But we lay the foundation, that is, we're trusting in Jesus Christ to forgive us our sin, that Christ died for me, my only faith is in him, and my only hope of heaven is that Christ died in my place. Now, that's the foundation that's laid. Then we begin to build, and I see Christ as my example, my great pattern. And so how was Christ in his suffering? How was Christ when he wasn't appreciated, when he was actively opposed? He was silent. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. He did not open his mouth. There was that one startling account where Jesus is being questioned, the questions fired at him. And yet we have that lovely verse, but he said nothing. And uh, he, he who could have called down legions of angels and the same on the cross, but there was that silent, uh, submissive saviour that we have. And so there are those times when we're dying to defend ourselves and, and we're uh, full of uh, indignation, and yet we can see here that our reactions when people don't like us, when they insult us, and where, when we feel they get in the upper hand, we've just got to entrust ourselves to our Father in heaven, just as Jesus did. We see this in Joseph, don't we? Um, Joseph was a pattern, a type of Christ in the Old Testament, and we can see how he suffers unjustly, put in prison, framed, and all kinds of dreadful things, and yet he's able to say right at the end when he's reconciled to his brothers, you intended to harm me, but he comes to that place where God intended all this for good. It's a trust in the sovereignty of God, even though we might feel like victims and it's unfair, yet we know that God ultimately is in control. That's a great place of rest, that God is in control of my life. Can you say that? Can you say that all that you are, all that you have, you've placed in God's hands, and he's your protector. He's the one that orders your days so that you can rest in him. So though your enemies try to assault you and overwhelm you and frame you, we see it in Daniel. Jar's going through that great book of Daniel, and so it's so helpful. Um, godly man trusting in God. Our reputations are safe in God's hands. Now, we take care of our conduct. If we take care of our conduct, he will take care of our reputations. So Jesus entrusted himself. Uh, and we saw Peter last week uh, refusing to have Jesus wash his feet. He was still in the driving seat. And isn't that pride? We're, we're all uh, control freaks by, by, by nature, and we want to be in charge of everything and everyone, but that's not our role. It's not our job to sort people out. You know, sometimes we have this kind of uh, commission that we've been sent on, that, that uh, we're to make sure that other people have the right attitude. Whereas, you know, just a moment, you know, our first priority is to sort ourselves out and allow God to take care of others and to deal with others and to have the faith to, to work out different situations no matter how difficult they are. When we look at church life, so if, if there are divisions in the church, it's normally by people who want to assert themselves and, and push their own agendas. What causes fights and quarrels among you, um, says James? Well, it's this whole uh, self-motivated, pride-motivated thing of wanting to push our own agendas, assert our own wills. The Apostle Paul writing to the Christians in Thessalonica, he says, this is 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 15. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and everyone else as well. Now that's a positive fruit, if you like, of humility. There's a, a kindness. We're not defensive, but we're kind to everyone as... Um, Paul writes here, and especially in the smooth running of the church, there's a, a genuine love and kindness, and, 
I think I've, I'm sure I've mentioned it before, but I was struck by uh, a pastor called um, Derek Swan. Derek Swan was uh, a godly Welsh pastor, um, ministered in Kent for many years, but I remember plainly hearing him at a minister's conference, dealing with many men who were smarting because of injustice, and, uh, and he was saying that um, it had a spell off from his church and he was visiting different churches, but there was one particular church he went to quite regularly. And every time the pastor prayed, he opened his prayers, every prayer, the same way. Dear, kind, heavenly father. And so this got the, the better of Derek Swan, and so he went to see the pastor one day. He said, Pastor, don't mind me asking, but why is it that every single prayer you begin to open with, dear kind heavenly father and he told him the story of how when the pastor first went there the church was completely split in two there was a dreadful heavy atmosphere and so he wanted to remind him of the character of God that God is tremendously kind so he prayed every time dear kind heavenly father and the church was transformed as they got a glimpse of the character of God and so we have a kind God, a God who has so shown his love to us. And we saw last week that Jesus, when he got down on his knees in the act of humility, and wanted to show the full extent of his love. So love is kind. Now, so our reaction. So if we have an attitude that is humble, then, then, then our reactions uh, will, will naturally, uh, we pray, um, be ones that are, are humble and, uh, and kind and wise in every way. But then our actions. Now these are positive things that we can do. Now you're going to say, I know it. And I'll, I'll, I'll number them, uh, one, two, three, four. And you'll say, well, we know that. Of course we know it. <laughs> but, but these are, are God's um, tools, if you like to help us fight this battle against pride. And the first one is, read your Bible. <laughs> you know, we, we, know, we know these things, but the Bible doesn't only build us up, it certainly does, but it, it, it brings us down, it, it humbles us, it puts us in our place. We can see that I'm not the center of the universe, God is. And so the Bible is that tremendous humbler so every day we take our pride medicine we go to the scriptures and they put us in our place they convict us of our sin and when we see our own sin we think well who am i to look at anybody else and criticize anybody else so the scriptures come and they deal with us and they shape us and they mold us and uh, when we um would give our our kids uh their Bible, we, we would buy them a Bible every now and then. I would write the same thing uh, in front of uh, each Bible. It was from, from John Bunyan, and it was simply either this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. And that's true for every one of us, that we need to come to the Bible, and the two can't coexist, that if we, if we read the Bible, it will convict us of our sin, but if we neglect the Bible, then we're just giving sin free reign and then prayer you know it <laughs> you know, prayer is is simply coming to the king now when we're on our knees no not necessarily physically but when when we come to god in prayer we we're, we're saying in effect we're beggars we're, we're people who are poor coming to the king of all things so prayer is a is a humbling thing and it's hard to be proud whilst you're in prayer. How can we be proud when we come to God to, to, to ask of him things or to seek his help or to, to, to thank him and, and, and praise him? Acts of love and service, that's the next thing. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course we should go around doing good as the Lord Jesus did. Paul writes to the Philippians, in humility, esteem others better than yourselves. So rather than looking around at others with a steely eye or a critical eye, you know, the humble person is aware of their own failings and so you know, are able to bear with others' faults, knowing that you know, I'm exactly the same as others. 
I'm so aware of trying to cope with my own faults that I've got no time to, to criticise others. And so it produces in me, hopefully, uh, a humble example and a willingness to esteem others better than, than myself. Um, Samuel Brengel. Samuel Brengel was a man greatly used by God in the Salvation Army, um, but he was pastoring a large church in the United States of America and heard about the work that William Booth was doing with the Salvation Army. And he was gripped by this. So he left his large church in the States and got on a boat and, and came over to enlist with uh, Booth's Salvation Army. Uh, yet Booth, rather than being pleased about the arrival of Brengel, he was a little bit concerned. And, and the problem was, he said to Brengel, that you've been your own boss for too long. So what he did, he, he gave Brengel the duty of cleaning the boots of all the trainees. Now Brengel came over and he thought to himself, have I left this large church in the States to come over and to clean these boots? And he found this real battle going on inside of him. And then he had this vision of Jesus stooping down, washing the, the dirty feet of those proud Galilean fishermen. And Brengel thought to himself, Lord, if you washed their feet, then I will blank those trainees' shoes. And so that was the turning point in the life of Samuel Brengel. It was an act. Now I said last week that we, we have this, a thousand choices every day, but there are certain maybe turning points where we, where we grapple with a certain issue and we humble ourselves, and it, it brings a great release. Number four, then, acts of worship. In other words, we're caught up with the greatness of God, and somehow it just decentralizes self. Again, I'm not the center of the universe, and I come before God, and so we've got so many tremendous passages we can go to to, to help us. For instance, Psalm 105, the beginning Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him. Tell of his glorious acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Well, he goes on. And when we're taken up by God, we see God in all his majesty and in all his glory. It affects us. We get our eyes off of ourselves and we're taken up. Self is decentralized and we're lifted up to see God. And we're full of praise and thanksgiving and it affects our attitude down here on earth. Jonathan Edwards um, saw gripped uh, a move of the spirit in the, in the United States, uh, 18th century. He was a, a pastor, theologian, um, but saw God work uh, greatly. But he, he writes on um, why there is uh, more praise in heaven than there is on earth, why, why, why praise is the dominant theme. And he says, the saints in heaven are so much employed in praise because they are perfect in humility and have so great a sense of the infinite distance between them and God. In other words, if we, if we could see into heaven and see the absolute splendor and the holiness and the majesty of God, we see the distance, uh, as Edward said, the distance between God and ourselves. And so the natural outcome is humility. As we see in Isaiah, given that vision in, I, in Isaiah chapter 6, he sees the majesty of God. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I'm surrounded by people of unclean lips, but my eyes have seen the Lord in all his glory. Last thing then, of course, it's the cross. Where do we see the glory of God so marvelously displayed? It's in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That spectacle, when we see the Holy One lifted up on the cross, to die. And again, when we think of the saints in heaven, they see the cross, they, they see the slain lamb more clearly than we do here. 
And so let me just read from Revelation chapter 5. Oh, and we, we capture the atmosphere because we have the, the, the angels, uh, you know, myriads of angels circling the throne and the, and the elders and all of heaven erupting in song. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that's in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. We will never get over the cross. We will never get over the wonder that Jesus, the Lamb of God, should die for me. It will be our theme forever. When there's a new heavens and a new earth and we've got new bodies and we're enjoying the splendor of fellowship in God's presence forever, never will we get over the cross. Never will, will we get tired um, we're limited now. We, we poor preachers, we try and speak about the cross. Certainly I'm, I, I'm frustrated at times. Lord, how can I convey the glories of the cross with this thick, stupid, stammering tongue? But when we get to heaven, then we'll be overwhelmed by his glory, his love for us, and we'll be on our knees. We won't spend all eternity on our knees, but this is a picture for us of Humility. This is our place with, with, with hearts full of praise and thankfulness and adoration and, and humility before God. The cross is where the Lord of glory was both humbled and exalted. Uh, we see here, this is the one of the cross. We'll see at Easter that the victim is the conqueror. That the one who was the least actually was lifted up and glorified by his death, and that he's exalted, and now um, uh, Paul goes on to speak about this, that he, he was exalted, the one who humbled himself to death, has been lifted, exalted to the highest place. And so the cross of Jesus Christ is the place where pride is most out of place. How can anyone stand by the cross with a proud heart? Um, John Stott again says, every time we look at the cross, the dying Jesus seems to be saying, I'm here because of you. So we stand beneath the cross and, and Jesus fixes our eyes on us and he says lovingly, I'm here because of you. Jesus shows them the full extent of his love. And slowly the Surely the greatest thing is, is not just to speak of the cross and um, not just look to the cross, but live near to the cross. Jesus, keep me by the cross, the old hymn used to say. We can stand before the cross only with head bowed and a broken spirit, said Stott. I think our world is looking for cross-shaped believers, is, isn't it? It's looking for hope that's real, um, looking for what human beings should be really like. And so we're being watched all the time to see our reactions and our actions and our attitudes. And um, I think it's worth being reminded of that, that we're being watched all the time. Maybe you're not aware of this, we think we're being ignored, but actually you know, Christians are such strange people that we're being watched all the time. What makes us tick? How is it that we can have hope in dark days such as these? How can it be that we have such a hope? Well, it's because of the cross and the resurrection, of course, of the Lord Jesus. Somebody once wrote, You are writing a gospel, a chapter a day, by the deeds that you do, and the words that you say. People read what you write, whether faithful or true. Tell me, 
What is the gospel according to you? Christian, you have been greatly loved. God's love has been set upon you and one day he will exalt you. (laughs) Humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God because the day will come when he will lift us up to the highest place to be with him in heaven. Let's pray. Teach us, we pray, Lord, more of the wonder of your love for us, of that cross-shaped love, that we might have cross-shaped lives, humble hearts, filled with joy and overflowing, because we ask it in Jesus' name.